Welcome to the very first episode of our Yacht Talk specials from London, where we go behind the scene to meet some of the world's most famous super yacht designers. And today we're in the lovely neighborhood of Fulham to meet Bannenberg and Raoul in their studios. Dickie. Morning. Hi, how are you doing? Good, thanks for braving the ones of Bridge Road. You're very welcome. A little gift from the Netherlands. Great, straw waffles, thank Indeed. you. Indeed, and some tulips. tulips. Thanks very much. You're very welcome. So Dickie, that's your father, John, a well-known figure in the yachting industry. A well-known figure, that's absolutely true. So you can't really come into the Bannenberg and Rail studio without some kind of uh, presence of Bannenberg Senior. So we have him have him here in our light box, which everyone sees as they come in. And I think it's, um, I mean, it's a really good image, I think. He's on the foredeck of a, of a very seminal um, design he did in the 80s, uh, which was incredibly groundbreaking. And it gives his thoughts on windows, never, never shy on giving his thoughts about almost anything, and looks super smart too. So everything wrapped up in one, in one good image. So welcome to the main part of the studio up here on the first floor. Um, and here we've got a kind of wall of, uh, well, a wall of yachts, but a wall of sort of uh, jobs in their various states of, uh, of progress. It's, it's mainly, as you can see here, general arrangement drawings. So in other words, just the plans of, of each deck. It's kind of life in, the life in progress wall um, and, the, and the most non-digital part of the studio. Anyway, why don't we sit down? Absolutely. Hello, Mark. Hello, Sean. I'm um, Mr. Cavendish. Hello, Dickie. Very nice to see you. So, gentlemen, we are together today to discuss an exceptional project delivered by Heeson in 2021. It's Mosquito, formerly known as Project Pollux. Yeah. But I believe it's not your first collaboration with Heeson, is it, Dickie? It's not our first collaboration. We, we've no. known and worked with each other for a long time now. 12, 12 boats takes a long time to build. I mean, mm. it's probably you know, 13, 14 years or something, that mm. time span, mm. so... Um, and with regards to Mosquito, mm. 55 metres, yeah. um, how did it all start? What was the brief, the original brief for the project? We started two of these boats together and they were called <laughs> Castor and Pollux, the heavenly twins. Castor and Pollux were, uh, they're 55 metre Heesons, we built a few of them, but um, Castor were, was the first one where we'd, um, we made the upper saloon much, much bigger and uh, we took the fifth gas cabin from the lower deck because the gas cabins were all a little bit compressed. Uh, so made that much bigger area, moved it up to a VIP cabin on the upper deck and then mm -hmm. I think we handed over to you with a relatively blank sheet and said, yeah. um, you know, do something that will be in hot demand. Yeah, that's, I mean, that, Mark summed it up pretty well and, and to, their, to their everlasting credit, um, <laughs> he do give us a very, a very, um, it gives a lot of latitude in terms of brief. Why is it such a special project? Um, I mean, this is probably, as Mark was saying, I think it's probably, he, he will give yeah, his the main perspective on because the Heeson have sort of it's developed. It's an evolution, and, yeah, isn't it's it? An evolution, it's exactly, not the so. first in the series, but um, as each boat went by, and it was, I think it's only about hull number four or something, the, the Castor was, and I think we hit it with both Castor and Pollux. There have been no improvements since, so we must have... Um, the matters where we uh, hit the top of the tree on that one. Um, but then that was the changes I mentioned earlier. So they were just internal rearrangements of the spaces to improve the spaces on board and make the whole thing better. More light coming in. Yeah, I was going to say, that, that's, a, that's a big yeah. um, enhancement, really, isn't it? Especially in the, on the main deck, yeah. there's virtually full height windows in the, in the owner's cabin forward and the main saloon. It's terrific. I mean, you get, the, you get this spectacular view with really pretty low That's right. um, sills. In, in the owner's cabin, I mean, they're outrageous. You've got about seven floor to ceiling windows. Mm. Unbelievable, the light that, um, and the view you get from inside there. Well, of course, you have delivered the project at a very difficult time, not just for Houston, but for everyone, really, the start of this uh, pandemic and Brexit, of course. So tell us about the main challenges and problems you may have encountered during the process. Yeah, that's quite a double whammy. Um, COVID, the COVID Brexit sequence, um, 
So COVID, first of all, even though here we are still with it, um, I mean, it, from our point of view, I think that the sort of remote supervision and interface with Heeson kind of wasn't affected too much. I mean, w whereas we used to do, I don't know, fortnightly visits or three uh, visits to the yard, every, those were just replaced by Zoom calls, inevitably, and samples being couriered back and forwards. I imagine for Mark, the, the business of how they how they ran shifts and uh, yes, for well, the shipyard it was tough. it was it was very difficult. But um, you know the Dutch are very organised people, so right from the start of this whole thing, we reorganised our shift work at the shipyard. Instead of having two shifts running together, we ran three shifts and starting at about five in the morning and finishing at ten o'clock at night. The result of that was we halved the number of people on the boats. We had to reorganize how the entry and exit arrangements operate. We had to reorganize the canteen so that there was social distancing in the system. But um, the shipyard never shut for one day. We never, we never lost any um, uh, day's work or productivity. Uh, not one of the boats that we were building was um, delayed, which was an extraordinary achievement in the, throughout that uncertainty. The bit that suffered, though, the, the, the tricky bit, was, of course, the commercial side, because all the flights stopped. And, of course, you know, clients, when they're buying yachts of this magnitude and value, actually want to come and see them and stand on them and touch them and feel them. Um, but you can say, going back to Pollock, so I think it was quite interesting. It's called, the owner, of course, bought the boat completely unseen. Mm. Um, he'd certainly never met you, no. and, um, and the great story is that um, he saw he finished everything with you, didn't he? You provided everything: yeah. the the furniture, no, that, the and fabrics, that the, is, the artwork. That's quite rare. Yeah. And it's quite. I mean, it's quite pleasing. And I, I actually don't mean it from a, a, a commercial point of view. I just mean it from a sort of design no, integr it's a, it's a integrity great point of, of view. Confidence. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so all all the furniture which we'd originally proposed with Heeson. Um, was sort of rubber stamped and approved, um, and then as Mark was saying, he I think felt, everything felt comfortable enough and yeah. said, "Yes, can you choose? Can you choose the art?" And that I mean, that's it's great to do from one level um, for us to kind of choose art to go with our interior, but at the same time, sorry, it, it was just you know it's such a personal thing choosing art. So there's a bit. It's a bit. Of I a, was going to ask you. I mean, anxious, how do you? A bit anxious making. But did you rely on your own taste, or did you have many conversations a bit. And with the clients? Of course, we. It's, it wasn't a sort of. Um, da da moment, here's the art, we, we got it all approved, but it's but the business of, of making a proposal um, it is a personal thing, but, and, but uh, everything, you know, we've, we put books on board, we put a... Um, uh, literally everything, almost yeah. down to the toothbrush, yeah, I imagine. Yeah, yeah, which is, yeah, which is a bit sort of old school in a way, it's the kind of thing my dad was able to do, and it doesn't happen that often these days, certainly with a, with a boat being built on, on spec like that, where it... That, that sounds like a dream, really, for a designer, being able to choose absolutely everything. Yeah, it is. Yeah. As in kind it of must have design, been quite joyful, Yeah, really. design control freakery, um, in a way. <laughs> to, I did not say that. No, you didn't say that. But, but I, think it's it's all, I think it's also a dream for the owner, because, of course, the provenance is perfect. You know, it's, it's, it goes from you know, beginning to end with the same uh, hand designing, uh, like a common thread mm. running through mm. the whole process of the boat, which I think is fantastic. Mm. And the boat was delayed as a result of all of this, the difficulty of getting um, all the um, materials and everything on the boat because of Brexit and so on. So she was eventually handed over in oh, March or something yeah. um, and sailed to the Mediterranean. And the first time the owner ever saw her was when he sat, set foot on her in uh, Malta, I think it was. That's quite, a, uh, that's quite a brave move, isn't it, to go to do yeah. a project that far without actually ever having yeah, it is physically it seen is, it, it or touched and, it. Yeah. And, and in the old, in the normal... He was happy. I was getting too much. And in normal times, you, you probably would have expected Mark and I to be there. To, oh, for sure, yeah. To, you know, to welcome yeah, someone on yeah. their new project, whereas we, we weren't there. So it's just... It's yes, just it's that, all you know, it's just, very, very uh, yeah. weird, that. Yeah. When a boat, uh, the way Heeson do this, when they're building on spec, it's, it's largely done, and then an owner will come in perhaps, whatever, two, three, four months, or perhaps earlier before completion. Furniture and thing hasn't been um, purchased at that stage, understandably, because there's a degree of owner preference. So when this owner um, bought Pollux, um, you'll have to remind me exactly when it was, but it was about... Sort of September. Was it September? Yeah. Okay. So no furniture had been ordered. Um, so you, had to, you have to spend a certain amount of time um, checking, 
confirming prices for it and checking availability. Um, and then, of course, you, know, you came to the point of December the 31st where, where Brexit happened, or, or at least the, you know, all the new rules. And I've got to say, from, from, from that point onwards, the whole business of ordering furniture and paying for it and the duties and the, and the confusions, frankly, about VAT and is, is VAT payable, is duty payable, is it, where is it produced, is it whole year, it, it's, it, was, it was just a nightmare. Well, you must have been right in the middle of all that as well. I mean, half of what you did was probably under the old rules relatively easy yeah. and then suddenly yeah, and there, was, there was certain lack changed. of complete lack of certainty. Um, yeah. So, Dicky, one more thing going yeah. back to all the different elements you had yeah. to choose for the uh, the yacht. Um, anything you've really enjoyed buying or providing for the yacht? Um, it's it's a, quite a privilege to be able to, of course, you've got to operate within a budget and not go mad. But to, you know, to have that broad range of everything, everything is open to you. You know, we we design the carpets and get those made. Um, Especially, and sometimes, depending on it, we will design particular bits of furniture, and that might be a, a dining table or a or a console. But we've certainly tried to um, look outside, kind of too many of the normal, if I can call them the normal suppliers. You know, you've always got to kind of keep a, a step ahead of things, so people don't say, "Oh, I, you know, I know that table, or I know those those um, table lights, or something." You've always got to be hunting for something new. So I, I remember seeing. I haven't even seen it in the flesh yet, but I think we've got a pretty interesting um, Dutch coffee table, actually, uh, from a supplier in Amsterdam, which I'm told, I don't think anyone was trying to trick me here, has got some kind of nanotechnology coating on it, um, so that little kind of scratches and marks, they, you think I'm making this up, don't you? They heal, no, them. They heal themselves. <laughs> um, what? No, no, they do, with, it, with this kind of... It's not a paint finish, but it's a whatever kind a of special finish. Special coating. Yeah, so if you scratch coating, so okay. it, will eventually... Yeah, you, you, you come come along legs. with your keys and go on there. But I think if you leave a, a, a little kind of nick or a mark in it, it heals. Get that for my car. Yeah, Amazing. Get it, yeah, exactly. Get it for life, I think. <laughs> yeah, actually. <laughs> Why do you think people like to have a Bannenberg and Raoul oh, design? I don't know. I mean, it's, it, you know, there's, there's, there's lots of studios out there. And with a certain amount of um, irony... There was, a, there was a great infographic published a few years ago by, I think it was Boat International, and it, was, it, it had my dad sort of orbiting in the, mid, in the middle of this galaxy, and then it had spokes coming off it showing how almost every studio was kind of directly connected, albeit yeah. one person removed. People yeah. who used to work for my dad or people who, you know, then somebody else worked for them. So all, all roads and all points lead and back to him. Um, and, and that so can't be easy, by, uh, by the way. No, do, do, I mean, you have, do you I'm feel, do you have this feeling that you always have to prove something somehow? Uh, it's a bit. And listen, I don't want the sort of small violin award here. Of, um, um, but yeah, I mean, it's a, it's, a big, it's a big shadow to be aware of uh, and, and try and not, not, you know, not be um, completely in the, sh in the shade of. Um, but it's been, no, it has been successful. Now, Dickie, in the next episode of mm -hmm. Yacht Talk, we'll be meeting Jonathan Beckett of Burgess. Joff. Absolutely, okay. if that's how you call him. It is, um, so he's known only as Joff. So I was wondering, do you have a pressing question for him? Um, <laughs> that's not an easy one, is it? It's not an easy one, <laughs> Mr. <laughs> Mr. Beckett. Um, I guess I'm, I'm curious to know, I mean, Joff's been in the, in, at the helm of Burgess for... Ever. Forever, yes, yeah. exactly. Um, so I think it'd be interesting to know what the first, his first yacht sale was. And how it went. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> not, not, yes. Okay, uh, so first went, boat so. sale and how it went. Yes. Well, gentlemen, thank you very much. Dicky, thank you very much for the fascinating insight into the world of super yacht design. And Mark, thank you for joining us. Next time, we'll be talking indeed to Jonathan Beckett of Burgess. That's in the next episode of Yacht Talk. Thank you for watching. And remember, keep yachting.